Hi, hello, my name is Beth and this is Rad Art, a show where I pick someone out of pop culture who is an American idiot. Tell you why I think they're an American idiot. It's tongue in cheek, guys. And then I draw them and I try a different technique just about every single time. There is a very, very sweet person who has been watching every single one of these videos and commenting all the time asking if I could do Green Day. And so I am clickbait. This one's for you, my dude. Check out how this puppy turned out. And if you stick around, I'll show you how it happened. Cool, let's do it. And so continues my role of pop punk emo bands with Green Day. Formed in 1986, Green Day is composed of three dirty boys, lead vocalist and guitarist Billy Joe Armstrong, bassist Mike Durnt, and drummer Trey Cool, which is the most buckwild name I've ever heard. Let's dive into this mosh pit face first and talk about Green Day. Armstrong and Durnt were friends from age 10 growing up in Rodeo, California. They cultivated their love and practice of punk music at Gilman, a now iconic nonprofit music club located in West Berkeley. This little studio birthed the 90s punk pop revival with bands like Green Day, Rancid, and The Offspring coming out of it and terrorizing the nation. At 17, the pair recorded their first official Green Day song and signed with the punk label Lookout to release their 1989 EP, 1000 Hours. Trey Cool joined later, in 92, for the album Kerplunk, and it was their 94 release of Dookie that placed them on the map as the next best thing in punk. They made it onto MTV with that album and performed at both Lollapalooza and Woodstock that year. It won a 1994 Grammy Award for Best Alternative Music Performance and sold 10 million copies worldwide, but it was a decade later that they released the album that brought them musical world domination, the 2004 rock opera American Idiot. Billy had a philosophy while running Green Day, and it was that bands who took breaks were never the same when they returned. Each album and tour led right into the next, and the band would practice up to six times a week. Dirt says that while Green Day was in its prime, we put our heads down for 20 years and never really looked up. The band took a nosedive in 2012 when it became clear that frontman Billy Armstrong was suffering from a severe drug abuse problem. A longtime heavy drinker, he began combining pills and was, quote, surprised I would wake up in the morning. The prospect of death stopped bothering him, and in September of that year, he walked onto the iHeartRadio Music Festival stage, blackout drunk, and flipped out, ranting about who he was, how he wasn't given enough time on stage, and using just about every bad word I know exists. He smashed his guitar, put a cork in Green Day, and checked himself into rehab. Durnt, being the best GD friend a man could ask for, wrote letters of encouragement to him while he was getting sober, standing by him through the good times and the bad. Fortunately, the story has a good ending. Armstrong has been sober for five years now, and Green Day just released their 12th studio album, Revolution Radio. It's got no gimmicks this time. It's just a good old-fashioned musical romp in the ear park. <laughs> Looking back, Armstrong had this to say about the creative process of making music. Quote, I learned that the hard way. You can't be enthusiastic for the sake of enthusiasm. You have to get out of trying to outdo and one-up yourself all the time. We had to break the habit because suddenly we weren't really being ourselves anymore. I was a little burnt out on being in Green Day and we needed to stop. Sounds like a refresher was just the right thing. To this day, Green Day has sold more than 85 million records worldwide and has been nominated for an astonishing 210 awards. They have five Grammy Awards, and even the musical adaptation of American Idiot was nominated for three Tonys. Most notably, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2015, their first year of eligibility. Green Day's music is deceptively simple, and it's inspired many a young musician to pick up a guitar and become that guy at the party. Hell, Time of Your Life was played at every single high school graduation I've ever attended, and I'd be lying if I said I'd never kissed a boy who sang it. I did. I did kiss a boy who sang it. Green Day has carved out a place in musical history already. Now let's hope that there's more to come. Hi, hello, my name is Beth, and this is Rad Art, a show where I pick someone out of pop culture who I think is a phoenix. Tell you why I think they're a phoenix? What? And then I draw them, and I try a different technique every single time. This time, I went on Twitch. Yeah, you guessed it, twitch.tv slash BethbyRad, that's where I went. And I asked you guys who you wanted me to draw, and also, what to do? We decided to play around with washi tape, which is like a Japanese scotch tape that doesn't really function that well as a tape, it works real nice for decoration, and to do Kesha. So here we are, this is what it turned out looking like. Does it really look like her? I'm not really sure, but we did it. Let's watch how it happened. After years away from the music scene, Kesha is back, you guys. In the wake of a horrible sexual assault lawsuit with record producer Dr. Luke, the American pop sensation Kesha has finally released her first new song in four years. Let's talk about how we got here. Born Kesha Rose Sebert in March 1987, Kesha grew up in Los Angeles. 
Her musically gifted mother, Patricia Seppert, raised Kesha on her own. Her vocal talent was recognized young, and her mother encouraged Kesha to develop it. Alongside her musical talents, Kesha was also academically gifted, getting a near-perfect score on her SATs, which is a pretty incredible feat. However, the pull towards music was too strong, so at 17, Kesha dropped out to pursue it. The move seemingly paid off when at 18 years old, Kesha was signed to Dr. Luke's record label, Kimosabi Entertainment. She threw a dollar sign in her name, sang backup for popular entertainers like Paris Hilton, Katy Perry, and Britney Spears, and after gaining notoriety singing on Flow Rida's number one single, Right Round, decided to kick off her debut album on her own terms. Her first single, TikTok, killed it in digital sales and broke records for the longest running number one single for a female artist on her debut single. Based on how often it was blasted on the radio stations in my hometown, it was safe to say that she became incredibly popular very quickly. She continued to grow in popularity from 2009 to 2013, releasing her second album, Warrior, in 2012, with every one of her singles landing on the Billboard Top 10 list. It was a whirlwind, which ended in January of 2014 when Kesha checked herself into rehab to deal with an eating disorder. Now, it's about this time that Kesha kind of disappeared. She wasn't collaborating with other musicians or releasing new music, so when the world looked into it, they found that she was in the midst of a nasty legal battle with the aforementioned record producer Dr. Luke, who Kesha accused of drugging her, and both sexually and verbally abusing her during her time with him at Sony. In an attempt to leave a record label that was forcing her to work with her abuser, she levied two rape charges against the man who countersued. After two years of litigation, New York Judge Shirley Korrak dismissed Kesha's case, citing that both alleged rapes happened outside the statute of limitations, and as for abuse, quote, claims of insults about her value as an artist, her looks, and her weight are insufficient to constitute extreme outrageous conduct intolerable in civilized society. Kesha lost her battle, and is still contractually obligated to continue producing music with Kimo Sabi Records, and the reaction to the ruling has been a bittersweet outpouring of love and support by both civilian and celebrity. Fans rallied around her during the legal battle, and hashtag Freedom for Kesha trended. Eventually, Sony promised that it would allow Kesha to record new music without Dr. Luke's involvement. And in April of this year, it was released that Dr. Luke is no longer CEO of Kimosabi Records, and may be in the midst of negotiating a split with Sony altogether. So finally, after years of silence, Kesha is releasing her third album, Rainbow. I'll end this rad art with a rad quote from this rad woman herself, because I certainly couldn't say it any better. In the past couple of years, I have grown into a strong, independent woman. I have realized through this long journey of ups and downs that if I'm lucky enough to have a voice that people listen to, then I should use it for good and for truth. I've battled intense anxiety and depression, a relentless eating disorder, and all of the other basic bullshit that comes with being a human. I know I'm not alone in that battle. Finding the strength to come forth about these things is not easy, but I want to help others who are going through tough times. Thank you, Kesha. You are helping. Hello, my name is Beth, and this is Red Art, a show where I pick someone out of pop culture who I think is oh so emotional. Tell you why I think they're oh so emotional. And then I draw them, and I try a different technique out just about every single time. Guys, this technique was a ton of fun. I used an old-fashioned quill pen, and some of you guys know about this because you watched me do it. That's right, my boys, my girls, I've got a Twitch channel. At Beth Be Ride down at Twitch, you can watch me actually draw the Red Art, put it together, edit it, all of that. I'll be streaming on Twitch from now on, link in the description, you can check it out. See a little sneak peek of this video before it comes up. But you're not here for a live stream, you're here to watch the actual video. And who am I drawing today? Gerard Way. Yeah! Here's what it turned out looking like, and if you enjoyed that, go ahead and stick around, you know the drill, I'm gonna show you how I did it! Unless you already saw it, follow me on Twitch. <laughs> Gerard Way is a singer, songwriter, musician, and comic book artist, but we all know him as the lead singer of the soundtrack of our tragic youths. Yes, I'm drawing the face of My Chemical Romance. Born in the year 1977, Gerard was raised in Belleville, New Jersey, alongside his brother Mikey Way. Gerard's maternal grandmother planted a creative seed in the boy while he was growing up and taught him to paint, sing, and perform. He would later write the song Helena in honor of her passing and to help deal with the loss. Not only is Gerard a musician, but he is also an artist. He graduated from the School of Visual Arts in New York, which is an esteemed arts college, and had every intention of pursuing a career in the comic book industry, but on September 11th, 2001, while working at Cartoon Network in New York, Gerard witnessed the terror attacks on the World Trade Center. That day changed every American's life, and Gerard was no exception. It opened his eyes to the futility of what he was doing as a basement artist, and so instead, he turned his efforts towards making a difference while he was still around to do so. 
He wrote Skylines and Turnstiles and co-created My Chemical Romance. Through the next 12 years, My Chemical Romance made four very successful albums. They became the quintessential emo band with their unique brand of violent, dangerous pop music. Funnily enough, Gerard describes the emo genre as f***ing garbage. But my dear sweet boy, isn't that an emo point of view to have? Now, regardless of genre, MCR's music was punky, popular, and cut to the heart of many young people's emotional struggles, but namely Gerard's. Gerard suffered with alcoholism, prescription drug addiction, and depression throughout his life. When the band took off, so did Gerard's drinking. At the time, it was just something he felt he had to do to be Gerard on stage, and his rock and roll attitude pushed him to rock bottom. Twice in his life he considered suicide, and he's quoted in saying that My Chemical Romance saved his life twice. Once in the beginning when I was depressed, and then again when I was an alcoholic. It gave me a purpose. In July of 2004, after a suicidal night high on booze, pills, and cocaine, Gerard went on a walk with his tour manager, and the band literally banded together and lended their support to him quitting drugs and alcohol. 17 days later, he was clean and sober and has been ever since. His background in art had a huge influence on each of MCR's albums, as well as his 2014 solo album, Hesitant Alien. Each album has a visual identity, a palette, and a tone. His illustrations are even featured as the cover of Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. After My Chemical Romance disbanded, Gerard returned to being the comic artist he started his journey off trying to be. His eight-page story, Apocalypse Suite, won the 2008 Eisner Award for Best Limited Series, and as of becoming a dad, his work has taken on a new life. The theme of family prevails through his recent comics, and on top of all that, he pops onto the TV scene every once in a while to write and direct cartoons. Gerard just can't keep his little hands away from making things in just about every creative field there is, and cheers to that, man. I'm right there with you. Like this video if you liked it, and subscribe to Snarled if you haven't. If you like me, I have both a YouTube channel and a Twitch channel called Beth the Rad. Links in the description down below. Also down below, we have the link to our store where you can buy Snarled merch. Leave me a comment with who you want me to draw on the next Rad Art, and then follow me on Twitch to watch it happen live! Ooh, I'm excited!